great crowd here. And thank you for, uh, we'll go ahead and have a seat here. Um, thank you so much. That was Tommy Sandra Petro there in the back. Another round of Thanks so much for, for coming today. Uh, we've got Tim Conroy back with us. Uh, he's been here before, two times before, so, you know, I say he's a, he's a main offender, but he's a repeat <laughs> offender. Uh, but he is, you know, third time's the charm, but he was pretty charming the first two times, and I think the testament to that is this, this great crowd out there, the packed auditorium here. Well, thank you all for coming yeah. today. I really appreciate it. It means a lot. You know, community libraries are important to me. I'll tell you a little bit why. They were a safe place to go when I was a kid. I could go to a library and get out of the chaos. It was a place I could go to and open a book and be a million miles away. And the, those librarians got to know me and got to know what I liked to read. And they would hand me books. So libraries, I think, are one of the most important elements of civilization, that and independent bookstores. So thank you all for being here. And Tim, you're, you are coming back, and you're coming back in a in a larger sense too. These are your old your old stamping grounds. It feels good to be back in a in a room where I know some folks. You know, I I taught uh, at Browns Ferry Elementary. I was an assistant principal at Andrews Elementary, and so it's, you know, I, I know this terrain and this geography a little bit, and so it's really comfortable to be back, and thank you all. Uh, and and uh, I, I think I told you I was driving by Grants Elementary uh, a few weeks ago at the end of the school year, and the placard out front, the sign said, great things happen here. Uh, it's just such a... Uh, it's, a, it's such a, a heartwarming sign, and it's true at the end of the school year. And I think we can say the same thing about the library. And, and hopefully after this, uh, this session today, we can say great things. Yeah, my, my, my goal for this session is that y'all will leave not having to make a mental health counseling appointment. <laughs> <laughs> or to take an extra walk or two on the beach <laughs> to clear your head. Um, you know, the, as I kind of reminisce a little bit around stories about uh, Pat and my family, you know, I think it's important to introduce them to you. And that photograph on the side uh, is, is what I would like to kind of talk about a little bit right now. And you see the, the guy on the right in dressed with lights on the bottom. He plays a pretty big role. The Beast, the great Santini, uh, he was a powerful figure in our family. Next to, on the bottom row, next to the dad, is my brother Tom. Freckled face, cute kid. Uh, he has that Pensacola tan. That's about as tamed as a Conroy gets. <laughs> um, and later, uh, it all goes to the dermatology appointments we have to make. <laughs> Uh, but so Tom was probably the brother I was closest to in age and, and, and uh, closest to just because we shared a bed growing up. You know, we, uh, we would make, we had a game we would play. We would make the bed together. My mom would shuffle down the hallway. And as we heard her get closer, we would pull the covers over her head and try to fall out the side and wrinkle the bed, wrinkle, you know, try to smooth the wrinkles out. Um, and we would try to make that bed together. So we would always fall together. Um, my mom, yeah, I'm, in, I'm the guy with the Coke bottle glasses, the military glasses on the bottom, and with the crew cut hair. And, you know, I would be, you know, immediately you can recognize I would never become a marine aviator. You can see those glasses, you can understand why. And my mom, you know, that photograph is just to me simply beautiful. 
her sun-kissed arms, her sun-kissed hair. In the back of my mom is my brother Jim. In the death of Santini, Jim would be referred to as the dark one. And he had a lot of reasons to be dark. I think he had, uh, I remember that picture was taken in Pensacola, Florida. And I remember Jim playing a night baseball game. And uh, one night he dropped, uh, he missed two fly balls, dropped them, lost them in the lights. And on the way home, even with a Catholic priest in the car, my father said, what the hell were you doing out there? And Jim said, well, I, I lost him in the lights. And my father hit him twice. And I learned, I learned, and it was, a, it was sort of a, a reoccurring theme. When a priest was around, my father would hit you more for whatever reason. Uh, my sister Carol is next to Jim. Now, Carol... And, and Pat's next to Carol. Now, Carol um, was an intellectual. She read everything when she was a kid. And, and, and her, she was, Pat and Carol were tight as thieves. And they had a fierce sibling rivalry uh, that centered around writing and learning and reading. And they challenged each other. Now, next to, uh, Pat is, uh, on the other side, is my sister Kathy. Now, Carol and Kathy were women in a, the most patriarchal family you can imagine. So they really did not count to my father. They got the worst deal of us all. They had to do more work, more chores than us all. And you know what I'm talking about. And they're fabulous sisters. Fabulous people, kindest people you ever met, but they got it worse than Pat. Uh, my brother Mike, he's a good looking kid, and he had all the athletic ability in the world, but in my father's eyes, Mike would never live up to his legacy because he was too short, he was too small, he would never start on the, on the starting five basketball team. It was just simply not big enough. So all the weight and expectations of the family fell on that. So I tell you this, that just because as we go through uh, this hour, you kind of know the lay of the land. I'll tell you the other pivotal thing, and I'll turn it back over to you to kind of um, flow a little bit. The other pivotal thing is Pat and Carol knew early on they wanted to be writers. In, in junior high, early high school, they knew they wanted to be writers. And they not only wanted to be writers at that time, they wanted to be poets more than anything else. Pat Conroy wanted to emerge as a poet more than anything else. And they would tease each other around a poem by a 20th century poet, and this poem would enter my imagination, and this is why I tell the story. The, the poem has a dark and foreboding message, and it goes something like this. To certain people, there comes a day when they must either say the great yes or the great no. Those that have the yes ready within them will reveal it at once and go on to the path in honor of their own conviction. Those that say the great no, if given the chance again, would say no again. Yet that no crushes them for the rest of their lives. And Pat and Carol would tease each other about who was going to say the great yes. Well, in my mind, what happens is both of them say the great yes. Carol goes on with her first collection of poetry and she wins a fellowship at UVA. And from her first collection, two of those poems are published in the Paris Review. Pretty good stuff. Then she goes on and publishes with Norton Press her uh, collection of poems, 
the beauty wars. Well, Pat graduates in that picture. The moment of time is 1968. And, and Pat is a teacher at Buford High School. And Pat, that year, is still frantically writing poetry and trying to figure out how to emerge as a poet. And what happens is he takes the job the following year at DeFusky Island. And he keeps a journal. And he starts to leave poetry a little bit. And he writes his observations about teaching and the kids. And he gets fired from that job. And still, once he's fired, he's, he's trying to figure out what he's going to do. Because he has a wife. He has two kids. He's trying to figure out how he's going to make money. He writes the book, The Water is Wide. And while he's waiting on things between the book coming out, he takes a class from James Dickey at the University of South Carolina. Because even after writing The Water is Wide, he still wants to emerge as a poet. Well, what happens is in that class, James Dickey reads his poetry and says, Pat, your realm is not poetry. <laughs> I don't think that that's your realm. Now, I think James Dickey had a huge ego. He probably told that to everybody. <laughs> but that's beside the point. So Pat leaves the writing of poetry forever. He never leaves the reading of poetry. And we know what he goes on to is this incredible literary legacy. But he leaves the writing of poetry forever. I think that sets it up good. Yeah. And I would say that Pat Connell joins a league of very famous novelist fiction writers who were uh, failed poets. F. Scott Fitzgerald, uh, Herman Melville was a poet, but much more famous as a novelist. William Faulkner, a just atrocious poet. <laughs> very good novelist. So that's, it's OK. It's OK. Um, well, in fact, some of his prose is poetry. When you, when you look at it and you read it, there's some passages that, as a poet, you know, I could do those line breaks, and, and you could easily turn that prose into poetry. It sings. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, the, you know, growing up Conroy, um, and, and, and on the outside, it looks like just a, you know, beautiful family. It is a more or less. Well, you know, you know the thing I think I talked talk to you, you last night, maybe a little bit about this, is, you know, I look at that photograph, and my brother Tom is not with us anymore. My youngest brother. My father is not with me, not with us anymore. My mom is not with us anymore. And Pat's not with us anymore. And, you know, I, I think about them all the time. Because this is what you do, right? You, like even with, with my wife's uh, mother who's gone, who's passed away, and her grandmother who's passed away, and her sister who's passed away, we'll be saying, well, Deborah would have said this, or Mimi would have said this, or Pat would have said this. So you invoke these people that meant so much to you in your life back into your lives. You don't forget them. And, I, and if you do forget them, I encourage you, don't. Bring them back. Bring them back into your daily lives. And because they're with you. And, and so, y'all, I say that because you're giving me an opportunity to invoke some very meaningful people back into my life today. So thank y'all for that. Um, and, you know, I just, I just think about these folks all the time and what it means. Yeah. And so the, the, the dead aren't dead. They're, yeah. they're very much alive. And... Uh, and you know, Pat had his say. We got the you know, it's a big, the great Santini, and it was made into a film, very good film with uh, Robert Duvall and and Blythe Danner. Um, and he also he wrote a, a, a kind of coda to it, but a thick uh, coda, the death of Santini, which you should check out if you haven't read that one in, in 2013. Yeah. and he said a lot of things uh, in between as well and after. 
But you know, what is, what is your say about growing up? I guess in the shadow of the great Santini, or growing up Conroy, but how would you? Well, you know, one, your, one of the things I'll be and I'll pivot to me, but I need to say this is when Dad, when 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 we grew up, and and after I'll start the story like this. In 1972, when The Water is Wide came out, my mom was very proud of that book and what Pat had done on the Fusky Island. So she, she invited Pat to uh, address the wives of the officers at the Buford Air Station. So Pat was going to speak to these military wives in 1972 about The Water is Wide. He gets in that room and he throws them all a curveball. Because that's not what he talks about. <clears throat> what he talks about is he challenges the women in the room not to let their husbands beat them or hit their children. And so he has half the room angry as hell with them. And then he has the other half really appreciating what he's trying to say and do. In the root, and and he, he says this, and he writes this in the death of Santini. He writes that that was the first inkling of writing the book, The Great Santini, and telling that story. So he goes on, and this book comes out in 1976. He goes on, and he writes this book. But he hasn't prepared the family. We don't know this thing's about the drop the way it's about the drop. We know he's writing fiction. We know it's kind of about a marine. But we don't know that it's actually based on our family. And Dad doesn't know it at all. And so when the book comes out, you know, Dad goes over to Pat's apartment in Atlanta. Oh, you named the book after me. This is great. Oh, what a son. And he takes the book home. And he reads the book and he hates it. He, in fact, he's so angry he calls Pat several times, just in tears. You've ruined my life, son. Everything. His family, dad's family from Chicago, disowns Pat, basically. Promises never to see his grandkids. So it is a real riff. Now what happens? And it never and then it happened like this. But gradually over time, the rift started to ease. Probably because of ego and fame. Because all of a sudden, Dad would show up sheepishly at Pat's signings. And Pat would invite him up to the table, and Dad would start signing books. And sometimes Dad would yell across, or uh, kid him, if he was sitting at the same table, hey, my line's bigger than yours. Because people really wanted to get Dad to sign the book. And so then they started to do some speaking engagements together. And so that riff started to heal. And then the movie came out. But the truth of it, and here's the thing I want to say, is that photograph where 1968, all the pressure on Pat to be Dad's legacy, to go into the Marine Corps, to be a fighter pilot. Instead, he's you know he went and took off a Marine Corps fighter pilot. More, I'm going to be a poet, Dad. I'm going to be a poet. Well, all that legacy he rejected, and he writes the truth, and he writes a story of truth. This is what literature can do. And this is only what storytelling and good storytelling can do. He faced the truth, wrote the truth, and it changed Dad. So Pat becomes Santini's hero. Just not in the way Santini ever guessed it would happen. So Dad has a great second act. He becomes a kinder, gentler father to his sons and daughters, and he becomes a great grandfather to Pat's kids. That's what good storytelling, great literature can do. 
And that's why I'm so proud of that. Because he, he literally, he would call this book the book he was born to write. And there was something in there about pivoting to me in my reflection. Yeah. I did not come out of this family unscathed. <laughs> You know, I, I can tell you this right now, and I think this is as honest as I can get. Pat had this incredible way of making everything hilarious. How many people in this room ever saw him speak? He was like a stand-up comic. He was hilarious. And it was all turning pain into humor. Well, I have another task. I turned pain into real sadness. <laughs> and that's what happened to me. All of it seemed overwhelming. All of it seemed sad. And to me, I had to fight through that cloud of sadness. And I go back to the path of the metaphor in the poem. I said the no to what really I thought about a lot, but I just denied myself. I said no to my writing. Now, Kathafi didn't know, that 20th century poet did not know the ferocity of, of Pat's love, of Carol's love, of my brothers and sisters' love. Because they never let me forget. They wanted me to write. Pat and Carol. Carol would send me letter after letter saying, here's who I should be reading, you should be writing poetry. Uh, and three years before Pat dies, he sends his friend Sam Wharton to my door. And, and, and that's the first time I say yes to my ending, to write. And of course, I have to go through uh, hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of mediocrity to emerge. But that's just part of it. Then, you know, Pat and Carol, that's the other lesson they taught me. I think, kind of, and this is simplistic. You know, I'm a, not a complicated thinker, but I think whatever faith you have, and I respect them all, um, even if you don't have one, I respect that. But I think somehow the universe loves the fools that dream big. So if you've not dreamed big, it's never too late. Have that dream, dream big, but also, I think once you dream big, and I've seen this, you have to work very hard to achieve that dream. So never say no to something you want to do. Dream it and, and do it. But work hard to get good at it. Yeah. And so the, the differing responses you know, Pat it, it could, I guess, export all that sadness and, or, or that pain, yeah. rather. And turn it into something immediately. He had that personality, and you kind of just it sunk inside you, but for a while, a long while. But you eventually did. You got it out, and you wrote. Finally, it took a while, and it took a lot of writing, but you came out, and it came out in poetic form. Theologies of Terrain, uh, 2017. But that writer came out. You're you're a poet. You did what Pat wanted to do all his life. Uh, kind of vicariously to get it through you. Um, so you chose a different form to get it out. Or maybe the form chose you. Yeah, you know, it's hard to know how to answer that because poetry was such, it's always been a vital part of my life. And, you know, it's always been a refuge uh, where, and I, and I kind of think, you know, the music you heard today. You know, if you, I kind of, if you think about poetry like music, find your music. Not all poetry is the same. You know, not all music is the same. You've got to find whether you like country, jazz, or blues, or rock and roll. Poetry is like that. You know, you've got to find the poetry that speaks to you in your whole soul. And you'll never, it'll be like music. You'll always want to it in your life. And so that's what happened to me. And poetry in these really key moments uh, have played a really important part. I'll give you an example. Um, and, and this is a hard example. Well, you know, 
I'll double book a, a therapy appointment after this meeting. <laughs> but uh, this this example comes uh, when I was actually living in McClellanville, um, August 31st, 1994. I was teaching at Browns Ferry Elementary. And that morning, I, early, early morning, 4 a.m., I get a call if, uh, from my brother Mike. And Mike tells me that uh, my brother Tom, who's had the onset of schizophrenia for 13 years, has finally succumbed to an episode. Uh, and he's uh, left off an apartment building in Columbia and committed suicide. And, it, you know, you know, you know, we all, in this room, there's a collective wisdom, there's experience of grief and great loss. And you know what it means. And, and so in that, uh, in the work of grief, um, I went to poetry. My brother Pat would call me and read poems to me. And so poems have always been really a, um, a, a way of consolation for me, a way to go into some uh, uh, place where I can uh, go back to figure out the human spirit a little bit, what it all means a little bit. And so, that, you know, poetry is essential to me. And, and, and it was essential to Pat. Let me tell you, he had volumes and volumes, collections of poetry, right at his writing desk. He would go to the left, go to the right. He would use it as fuel for his prose every day. And he would go to, and read uh, poets, he would buy new poets, um, and he was just an avid lover of poetry. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, poetry kind of has, has that music built in with the rhythm and the, uh, the words. The words are chosen a lot of times for the sound. Uh, so it's, that, it's there, and, uh, and uh, I, I think it's and that connection, what do you think that is, the connection between poetry and grief? And grief is that, I mean, it was personal in your family, but do you think there's a, a deeper connection um, with poetry and grief? Well, I, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I think there's different ways people, uh, the work of grief is, and how you do it is so individual. And, and so, it, and you never know how that work really manifests and doesn't ever go away because as we get older, we certainly lose more people that we love. And so, I mean, it's part of, uh, I think, what, you, what um, um, we all do in, in, in terms of the reading and writing of poetry. Um, and if you're interested in writing at all, whether it's prose or poetry, I think it's not a bad way to start with something or somebody that, that uh, has such an emotional response that you, grief sometimes is a good place to start from to write um, because you feel the emotion so strongly and it's authentic. And that's not a bad place to start point or prose, it, in my mind. But, you know, and I'll tell this story because now that I'm kind of focused on time a little bit, um, I want to tell a story about my because I think it's important for y'all to know. When I, when I moved back to Columbia, I took a job at the South Carolina Department of Education. And I was going to work in the Office of Exceptional Children, and I was going to be in the area of autism and assistive technology. And that's basically, I was a special education teacher <coughs> for my career, uh, and spent some time as an assistant principal. And so one of the worries I had was the building in Columbia, the Rutledge building. The parking lot was in view, in sight, of the apartment building where Tom had jumped off. And so I said, Terry, I don't know how I would do it. I just simply don't know. And she said, as a Winthrop University graduate, she said, we'll figure it out. Don't worry, we got this. And she was going back to school uh, at the time to get her master's in library science. So we would get out of the car, park the car in the morning. She would take my hand, 
and we would walk towards Tommy's building. They had put a coffee and bagel place in the, in the bottom of the building. And we'd go have coffee and I'd eat a bagel. And we would tell Tom stories. And at first, it was so hard. But as the months went by, I looked forward to it every day because it was healing me. And my wife figured that out because I would not have known that was what I needed to do. And it was such a healing thing. And it was, uh, you know, we kind of mentioned this when, when I had the release of Theologies of Terrain, the, my poetry book. Um, I was, I did it at, uh, at a friend's uh, place, a coffee sandwich place in Columbia called Immaculate uh, Consumption. <laughs> it's a fabulous place. It's on the same street of Tommy's building, a block away. So when I read my poetry uh, and faced the audience, the building was to the back of me, immediately across the street. And I just felt like there had been a circle completed. Uh, and it was one of those moments. Pat used to talk about this. If you lived long enough, these great circles would close. And and I see that more and more. That you know, you do have these these uh, events that you just amaze you if you if you pay attention and and the people in your life and the events in your life and every the universe will conspire. Yeah. And and often like you're saying about your, your father, often not in the way we plan it and not in the way we want, it, but the, the way that the, the great Santini changed him, but made it better. And there, you know, it's unlooked for, but it, it can come about in a much, a much better result. Um, and and you, you, the, the title of this session is you know, Family Secrets, Family Truths. It is plural, both of those are plural. Uh, the secrets and the truths, do you, do you have different you know, a different vantage point on, on growing up in that household with all that abuse surrounding you, uh, inflicted on you. What, do you have different secrets or different truths? I, 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 think, I think there's one, I don't know if I've ever said this one in, out loud, <clears throat> but I'll, I'll tell you. And I got to kind of put it in time, in secrets. 1976, The Great Santini comes out. 79, the movie comes out. I'm at Carolina, um, you know, I start at 75, 1975. And I'm too young. I'm 17. I'm not really prepared. I'm, I really am pretty much a mess. And so, you know, I'm not having a whole lot of success. And except I'm having probably a lot of success finding. Um, um, the, the student uh, bars and, 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 and mess it up. I'm having a success with mess up. Um, three years later, my brother Tom starts college in 1978. And we're roommates. And Tom does really well his freshman year. And he's, he's a sharp kid, he's smart. And he is focused. Around the fall semester of 1979, you know, nearing the time the movie is coming out, um, Tom starts acting strangely. He's not getting up, up out of bed. He's not going to class. He's not really cleaning up. His friends start coming to me saying, what's wrong with Tom? He's having these emotional anger out that he's never had before. He wasn't an angry kid. And, and then all of a sudden he disappears. And he, he, he's not, you know, I'm, I'm freaked out. I call dad. And dad comes down from Atlanta. And for the next six weeks, we go to the police. They don't know anything. They, they haven't, um, they don't have anybody um, in jail under Tom's name. And so dad hits the streets of Columbia and drives 
I'm talking 16, 18 hours a day looking for Tom. Everybody's frantic, everybody's worried. About six weeks later, we hear from the police department that Tom, in fact, had been arrested and transported to the forensic unit uh, at State Hospital. And soon he would be diagnosed with the onset of schizophrenia. So, and I, I say this to put this in context because here I am. I'm a mess. My brother has the onset of schizophrenia. I'm coming from this abusive background, family. I'm trying to make sense of the world. And around that time, I meet the woman I married, Terry. And it, I think immediately we knew we were going to just be destined for each other. Um, in fact, um, I can tell you all this because she's not here. She probably had a worse father than I did. Yeah. And right? It was one of those situations. And so we, you know, early on, and I'll fast forward a little bit, when we started to talk about getting married, I said, Terry, I can't have kids. And she said, why? I'm afraid if I have a kid, I might kill him. Because that's what I read. You, you know, you, you become your father. And I don't want to do that. She has tell me not to do that. that. You know, don't worry about that. You're not going to do that. And I said, well, the other thing I'm afraid of is I got the schizophrenic gene. If I have kids, I don't want to, I don't want, you know, to raise a kid and then at 19 or 20, uh, the onset of schizophrenia happens. So don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. But those two thoughts were in my head. So here's how, here's how it worked out. I said, Terry, I'm a teacher. I'm going to have kids. They're going to be around me. I'm going to be the best teacher I can be. And Terry said, well, that's fine, Tim. If, if that's really what you, your decision, if you don't want kids, that's okay. So what happens is Terry's sister, Deborah, has a child named Philip. Deborah goes into the army. She divorces her husband. And she goes to Terry and goes, can Phil live with y'all? And we say, sure. And she gets transferred to Korea. Philip ends up living with us through high school. Um, he goes into the Air Force, gets out of the Air Force, and attends um, school in Florida, becomes a, um, a registered nurse, and he has a kid. So, you know, somehow the universe conspired for us to have a kid anyway. And, it, and that's probably given us the best, biggest joy that you can imagine. And that's a family secret I've never shared. <laughs> that's a great point. Yeah. And, it, and you know, talked about those great circles. Yes. And I imagine as an educator, that, that is, I mean, that's so, such a crucial, such crucial good work out there uh, and in this state. And that's, that's just spreading, um, spreading the, the good work out there. And, and uh, that is a kind of, it's a kind of parenting for sure and uh, outside the home. So that is crucial work being that, that sort of, and especially as a male figure, a father figure out there for so many uh, children and children in need. Um, so uh, so that's, that's essential. Um, and I know, you know, we talked about this yesterday, you're continuing to do that kind of thing, playing chess uh, with the neighbors. Uh, and yeah, the neighbors. Uh, yeah, I love, so um, you know, them. one of the, the people in my life that, uh, the, the person who uh, took the photograph for this book, the photograph is part of a monograph uh, a collection of photography in a book called Into the uh, Flatlands. And it's a book of photography by a University of South Carolina professor in the School of Visual Arts by the name of Kathleen Robbins. And her book is fabulous. Uh, well, I saw her present this book um, at the State Library. And I, I immediately bought the book. And I just love these photographs. And, she turned me on to uh, a collection of photographs by her friend, 
Maude Schuler Platt. And so between these two books, Maude's book was Delta Dogs, I wrote a poem called Theology of Terrain. And this was about the time towards the end of uh, Pat's life. He probably had a month more uh, left. And he was too sick to be bothered with reading this poem because he was just kind of, he was going from hospital to hospital and I wasn't going to ask him uh, for his opinion on it. Uh, so he never gets to see this point. After Pat dies, um, Kathleen goes, I'm going to have an installation of my photography at the Columbia Museum of Art. Would you like to read your point? And I said, Kathleen, it would be wonderful. So this is in May. Pat had died on March 4th. The person who had come to my door to ask me to join the writing group three years before, Sam Morton, had died in April. So both these huge figures in my life had passed away. So the curators of the museum uh, put the poem, converted it on the wall. It was about the size of my brother Pat. That's how I kind of felt about it. And I stood next to it, and I read the hell out of that poem. And her beautiful photographs are on the walls. And it, it was just a special moment. And I drifted down the hallway after the gathering. And I entered the main exhibit hall of the Columbia Museum of Art. And in the main exhibit hall, to my amazement, were photographs of um, Jean Mutasami Ash, Ash's photograph of Defusky memories. And all these iconic images of Defusky were on the wall. And I was looking around the room, thinking about Pat, and in the middle of the room, was a plexiglass case. Uh, and I walked over to the case, and the curators of the museum had borrowed Pat's original manuscript, handwritten on a yellow legal pad of the water is why. It was one of those magical moments, and I thought, that's it. That's the great yes. That's the honor of your own conviction right there. And it, it was, it was it was a remarkable moment. But Kathleen uh, would lose her husband this summer. He, he was 50 years old. Ben Madden you know, was a run, ran every day, was an athlete. He, he was working out at the gym. He was swimming laps. He went up, changed his clothes, had a massive heart attack, and died. Died. And, um, and what Daniel's referring to is, is I have the privilege of going over. Ben had taught their nine-year-old son how to play chess. And now I get to go over and play chess with the fabulous Asher Madden. And, and, um, and I'm telling you, the first few weeks after Ben died, those chess games, they were so hard because it, it, it just you know, it was just a, a tragedy. They're working, they're doing okay. It's been about, uh, you know, a year now. Um, and it's, they're doing okay. It's, it's been tough, but you know how, how that is. Yeah, the, the work of grief. And, uh, and, you know, it is, the work of poetry or the work of writing is, you know, helps. It, it, it helps to work through grief. It can be parallel. And the work of reading, you know, can, can help with that. Although, you know, is there, did you ever feel that, uh, that writing about your pain and, you know, these difficulties, especially your family difficulties, that that deepened your depression or your troubles? Was that ever a, you know, that, that you had to relive these memories? or? Or did the writing give you enough distance? No, I, I, you know, for me, I think it's always been trying to get to um, uh, through the writing redemption. You know, I think maybe salvation, maybe uh, get to some truth, um, maybe get to understanding, and I hope it conveys to the reader that search um, too. And so I think that's what 
you know, I think that's what I've tried to accomplish in this book. Simply the thought of the collection was that there's people in your lives and places in your lives that are so important, they become your theologies. And that's what I try to express in this book. Well, that's, and, and it is something, you know, we should say a lot of, a lot of folks are kind of put off by poetry. They say, they think they don't understand it, but, I, you know, I think you, the, that's, there are some kinds of poetry you know, I was a poetry scholar. You've read so much poetry. We, we both, there, there's some we don't understand. I mean, it's like magnetic poetry on the fridge, and it's meant not to be understood. But forget about that stuff. These are, these are poems you can understand. They're, 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 they kind of tell little, little stories, uh, vignettes, but they, they're also, they're meant to reach out to other people. They, they help other people. They're, uh, they're not just, uh, you know, navel gazing, uh, picking the, the lint out of your own navel. They're, they're meant to uh, to connect with others. So it's it, they really are. Uh, they're very much worth reading. Uh, so I think Tim, would you do us a favor and pick out one of these to read, and then we'll maybe we'll open it up for folks to, to ask you some questions. Uh, yeah, that would be great. I'm trying to think of, you know, I, since I just told you the story, Kathleen, uh, let me tell you another story, Kathleen, which I think just um, illustrates what sort of person she is. Y'all remember Hurricane Joaquin? Yes. Well, in Columbia, you know, it brought five or six days of this constant rain. And it it rained so long and so hard, a lot of the dams in Columbia broke. And people's lives um, were changed forever. And a lot of homes were just simply ruined. And then some neighborhoods could not be rebuilt uh, because of the damage. So after the rain stopped, um, Kathleen lives not directly across the street, but Caddy Corner a little bit. And being the nosy neighbor poet that I am, I stare out the window a good bit, and I noticed all these cars pulling up to Kathleen's house. And people would um, drop off boxes. Or they would bring in hair dryers. And I'm like, Terry, something's going on at Kathleen's house. i got to walk over there and see what's going on. And so I walk uh, across the street, and um, I asked Terry first, can I have your hair dryer? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously they need them. And so, and, 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 um, we never got that hair dryer back. I have to ask Kathleen. <laughs> but um, I walk over there and they had organized, Kathleen and some other women, had organized an effort to rescue photographs, restore photographs from the muddy waters of the flood that had come in the houses and ruined these photographs. And so what they had done was set up these stations. First you had to unstick them very carefully. Then you had to wash them very carefully. And then you had to dry them very slowly and methodically. And, and if they got to the stage where they really rescued them, they would wrap them up in this beautiful tissue paper and give them back to the family. Well, what would happen is along the way, some of these photographs, the emulsion would peel away. And you would think you were about to rescue the photograph, and all of a sudden the emulsion would peel across the photograph. So, you know, with that effort, I, I wrote this poem. Apertures. In a soft composition of rain, then an outpouring of grand expanse, rising to the hackberry, overwhelming the new deck, we fled a thousand years. When floodwaters recede, the flesh of homes sullied and sick, we focus lenses to memories, cross thresholds as shadow and light, see the demarcation of chance, watermarks on walls above the ruin of below, 
bone dry oyster men in Savannah, wet muck on fresh and loved faces, emulsion peeling layers of occasion from photos not worth another word, toss albums into dumpsters, curse cameras from unlivable spaces, their apertures fixed to fate. Was it ever real? Our trip to Italy, the wedding on the beach at Edisto, stubbornly adhering to each other, no longer salvageable. <coughs> so, I wanted to read this poem just because it's, you know, I remember these people. And it's for um, Terry, my wife. It's for her sister no longer with us, Deborah. It's for her mother, Jerry, who for the last 13 years before she passed away suffered with dementia. Jerry, by the way, loaned me her car. She taught me how to drive a stick so I could drive down to Buford so my mom could meet Terry. So I, I love, I mean, Jerry was just so important to me. Uh, and, and her, Jerry's mom, Terry's grandmother, Sarah Mackley. And I learned something about women. And I learned something about the strength of women through all sorts of tragedy and complications. So I don't know if y'all know the southern plant, the succulent I call hens and chicks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hens and chicks, in this swirl of trouble, turn to your inheritance the clippings of sisterhood grown in grief-watered soil, pap for the driest times, poised on pickets and tins, perched next to foundations, on ledges in terracotta, clustering in tight-lipped resolve, Rallying to you again and again, blooming, perishing, a descendancy of tough rosettes, the succulent hearts of kinswomen. People, places. You know, one of the things, and I'll go back because I, I, I want to kind of end on this note. I know we're. Um, close. The last couple pages of the great Santee where Pat evokes God and faith. I love, I think of some of his best writing. And I know a little bit about the story of that last chapter because he had to fight uh, Ann Barrett as editor to keep it in. Because the writing is so different in that last chapter. He really goes for it. Uh, and he, I think, transcends in that last chapter. And if you want to pick some parts that are poetry, it's that last chapter. So I'd like to read something from that. Because it just speaks to me in my journey, and maybe this time, is two and a half pages. Okay. Y'all bear with me? <laughs> to set it up, the funerals happen. They're driving out of town. Pat's uh, character, Ben Meacham, is assuming the mantle of his father, and they're driving out of Ravenel, a fictitious town, going back to Atlanta. And he realized that he lived in a Santiniless world now, and he trembled when he thought that he was, in many ways, relieved that his father was dead. It made him angry that a burden was lifted from him at his father's funeral, and it made him suffer. He wanted to wake his mother and to ha ask her questions, but he knew that Lillian could not help him now. Twenty-five miles of highway passed without his knowledge. 
25 miles vanished because men had retreated to the land behind the eye. The children of violent men developed vivid powers of fantasy. Ben Meacham wanted to pray, but he was afraid he was not worthy of prayer. But he was even more afraid that he was, had no belief in prayer. Yet, he had belief in wonder. And in the next 25 miles of Black Carolina Highway, he thought, Can a boy begin a prayer with the hatred of his father in his heart? Can that boy walk up to the altar of God and can he lay that hatred out? Can he spew his hate and tell his story? Can he tell about beatings and humiliations? Can he tell of the Marine who stormed the beaches of his childhood? Can he look into the eye of God and spit into that purest source of light for engendering his soul in the seed of a father who did not know the secret of tenderness, a father who loved in strange, undecipherable ways, a father who did not know how to love, a father who did not know how to try? And what would this God be like? This God, Ben Meacham. This God that Ben was losing fast and barely believed in. In the privacy of the next hundred miles, Ben thought about the kind of God he would approach. That the God would have to look a certain way. And in his mind, Ben began to assemble the God he would speak to about his father. This would be the God of Ben Beecham. Ben would give him the sweetness of Lillian. The dark, honest eyes of Arabelle, the soft virility of Mr. Dacus, the birthmark of Pinky on his throat, and Ogden Loring's upcountry draw. Ben would give him the shoulders of Virgil Hedgepath, the innocence of Karen, the spoon and tears of Mary Ann, the high pitched laugh of Sammy, Matt's intensity, and the loyalty of the Gray. And Ben would put this God on a street like River Street. And he would have this God lift his voice in the holy song of tumor. The hands of this God would be bright with flowers that would never die. And this God would sing and stutter and limp along an alleyway and pass judgment in the land beside the river. He would hold mercy in a bouquet of azaleas and he would listen to Ben. On the 60th mile, Ben could see the sky as he crossed the Savannah River into Georgia. He could see him in the canvas of his eye, in the brilliant kingdom of his eye. This God was leaning back against the wall of Hobie's restaurant, dazzling the universe with the beauty of Tuber's song. Ben would interrupt this God, and this God would not mind. And can one boy who has said 10,000 times in secret monologues, I hate you, I hate you, as his father passed him. Can this boy approach this singing God? And can he look into the eye of God and confess this sin and have that God say to him in the thunder that is perfect truth that the boy has not come to talk to him about the hatred of his father, but has come to talk about mysteries that only gods can inter interpret, the only, that only gods can translate. Can there be a translation by this God all strong and embarrassed, all awkward and kind. Can he smile as he says it? How wonderful the smile of God as he talks to a boy. And the translation of the boy screaming, I hate you, I hate you, to his father who cannot hear him. It would be simple for such a God. Simple, direct, transferable to all men, all women, all people of all nations of the earth. But Ben knew the translation, and he let the God off with a smile. Let him go back to his song, back to his flowers on River Street, in the secret eye behind the eyes, in Ben's true empire, he heard and saw and knew. And for the flight jacketed boy on the road to Atlanta, he filled up for the first time. He filled up even though he knew the hatred would return, but for now, he filled up as if he would burst. Ben Meacham filled up on the road to Atlanta with the love of his father, with his love of Santini. Good stuff. Yeah. Good stuff.
let's let's do we have some some questions from the crowd out there? And we folks for tests. I just want to have a statement. I like when I hear poetry more than reading it myself. I don't know whether. No, I, I, I completely I just get love that. It yeah. Said out loud. yeah. You know, I love going to poetry readings. Also, to hear the poet and how a poet expresses and, and gives voice to the poem. You know, part of poetry um, is that it's, a, it, it's meant to be read, right? It's meant. And so when you hear a poet give their voice to a poem, I think it is a, uh, a pretty neat thing to, to, to hear and witness. Um, you know, I have one other thing. <coughs> One other thing, which I think is remarkable, and I think it's if you have time for it. It's a letter, letter dated May 15, 1976. And it's sort of a letter, it's a letter written to by my father to the kids. And it's about the book. And it's a pretty remarkable letter. But I'll let you if you don't have time. All right. Uh, okay, let me see another reading. May 15, 1976, to the Magnificent Seven. Let me start my epistle by simply stating that I was deeply touched by your oldest brother's literary endeavor. Pat is a very clever storyteller, and I was totally absorbed and encountered every emotion as reading very slowly, life with father unfolded in this work of fiction. It was though as though I knew some of the characters personally. <laughs> Pat did a, sur a superb job in developing the characters Marianne. It's excellent on Ben, Lillian, Karen, Matt. With all modesty, fell far short on Santini, which is quite understandable with such a dashing and complex character. My absolute favorite parts, not necessarily in order, were, and you all may not remember all these scenes, one, Dave Murphy, two, Mess Night, three, tumor scenes, four, our trip to Buford, five, Bull goes to the base, six, opening chapter, seven, Bull and Ben out to the recruit depot, eight, archaic word usage, nine, Mary Ann and Ben prom night, ten, Ben's basketball game. Char characters which I enjoy that were non-family, were Tumor, Docus, Loring, Jim, Don, Spinks. But the setting for some was interesting and often amusing. In all honesty, I read the first hundred pages and I was furious. At page 222, not that that page is important, I was livid and I put the book down. And when I resumed reading it, it came easier for me. And now I look back, the writer had me. And many readers will feel much the same in the palm of his hand. I laughed at some scenes, cried at others, figuratively speaking, of course. <laughs> and you came away a better person, person having lived with the Beatles. I thought the book was great and should make a real terrific flick. But how do you go about the task of telling your son and his family that you are profoundly grateful and extremely proud of his latest literary endeavor, particularly when I fell into his literary trap and could have choked him as often as a twice a page early in the book. But he would only say, read on, Macbeth, read on. When you're Irish, Irish, dumb, and then stupid, it is a series of major obstacles to overcome. Each of you possess an essential quality of greatness could, that cannot be explained as to the whys and wherefores, but I can only thank the deity for his benevolence. Pat's literary ability has never been excelled as in his plea with God in the last pages of the book. Maybe the reason I was so impressed was that it was in the area of religious discussion that I had my greatest concern and my gravest reservations. All of you should read these words. His informal prayer does great honor and glory to our deity. We will take turns rejecting God and for one reason or another, but the spirit can never rest until you make your peace with the Creator. And so the hound of heaven 
shall pursue each of you. To Pat, my oldest son, may you forever wear the cloak of authority as befitting the eldest Conroy, as a sign to all of our pride in you as son and brother. And may Barbara and your children have the patience to endure the idiosyncrasies of such a claim. Signed, lovable, likable, Donald Conroy. <laughs> The truth of that letter is he was doing damage control. You know, the whole, the whole thing about he's a great storyteller. He's not admitting the truth. He's sort of like he's threading the needle about what really the truth is. And he never does admit the truth of his abuse. He always is a, a denier of that. But yet, he does change. And yet, that book does save him. Yeah, you come, come away a better person, he says, but he says kind of does it. Yes. You know, general yes. cliche way, but. But he was no dumb. You know, he was yeah. pretty clever. Yes. Is the story of Tunnel? Yeah. Well, no, there was a kind of a character like uh, Tumor and, and Pat, like any fiction writer, would kind of um, use uh, bits and pieces. But I'll tell you this Tumor's name was named after. Somebody in Buford who's a racist, and Patton would often do that in books. He would, uh, the character um, that is Eddie Detraville, who plays, uh, who's the character in the movie, uh, you would know, the, the Prince of Ties, George Carlin, who's the neighbor of Savannah in New York, um, is named after somebody who was homophobic. And Carlin's character is gay. So Pat was, you know. <laughs> so Tumor did not die. No, no, that, that, that was special. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. I heard on NPR um, your family discuss your life or your lives. How, how long did it take for all of you to get together, to come together, to feel comfortable literally discussing your lives after yeah, it, it was a process you know like sister kathy you know when mom when mom and dad divorced um in 19 they separated in 74 i think the trial was maybe 70 early 76 before the divorce came through um kathy testified at court about dad's abuse and the lawyer introduced the book as evidence. <laughs> but the judge at the divorce, and this is one of the great unbelievable uh, uh, injustices that ever happened to, to a woman. The judge was an ex-military man. And mom got no alibi after a lifetime of being with him. She did not get one penny of his military pension. But she kind of has a, a good thing. She marries, two years later, she remarries a really gentle man, Captain Eden, who was a, a naval doctor. But she dies much too young. She dies seven years later after the divorce at the age of 59. Yes? Yes? I know that this has been about Frank Santini, but I'm curious how factual the story of Prince Tides is with Pat and his sister. Well, you know, they they had this um, really strong sibling rivalry. And at first, when they first sort of both were emerging as writers, they were still fairly close. Um, uh, Carol felt very betrayed by the Prince of, uh, Prince of Tides. And in fact, she was going to write the two poems that are in that book. She was slated to write for the Prince of Tides. She kind of caught wind about what, how her uh, character was being portrayed in the book. And so she decided not to write those poems. And Pat ended up writing, you know, I say he, he didn't write any more poetry, but he wrote those two poems in the Prince of Tides. 
And, but, and their relationship never healed. Never healed. It never had a moment uh, where, um, and Carol's complicated. You know, Carol had mental illness challenges and still does throughout her life. Uh, she did not have schizophrenia. Uh, that wasn't her. She, she was more of a kind of a, what they used to say, sort of manic present, but I don't think they use that term anymore. Yeah. Yes? Um, I just found your really interesting of the siblings ended up being writers of some sort. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you think that was in spite of or because of your childhood. Well, you know, there's that, there's that Wallace Stevens quote that's paraphrased by the Irish poet Seamus Heaney. Um, uh, it goes, <laughs> imagination presses back against the violence of the world. And I think that's what happened. Uh, I think what happened is, is Carol and Pat, and, to, and I love the thing about the eye and that thing that I read, his emphasis on the eye, the eye behind the eye. And I think they just fled to, a, to an imaginary world. And I think poetry is a pretty good place to go there when you're going to um, a world. Um, and, and I think he had great teachers early on, too, that. Um, that helped to, to expose him to great poets. Yes? Then I know it's a fiction book, but in The Prince of Tides, is, is there any part of Lila that's like your mother? You know, I love that the, the Great Santini, I would say, is a father haunted book. The Prince of Tides is a mother haunted book. And so, yes, there is some truth because, and it's not. You know, you have to understand the trajectory of life when you're living in an abusive situation. Mom wasn't the same mom, you know, after 20 years of living with that, or after 27 years of living with that. She wasn't the same mom anymore. You know, it had, she had changed. And so some of that coldness that you're seeing is, is a mom that has suffered through a lot of scenarios of abuse. Um, the movie, remember the movie scene uh, where Santini is drunk after attacking the family, he goes out to the lawn uh, and he's stumbling around and, and the character, the Lillian, the mom sends Ben out to find the dad before it gets to be light. Well, in Two things about that. Um, one is when Pat first wrote that scene, and, and he wrote it differently. He wrote that he jumped on his father and just pounded him and just beat that guy, beat him up, and, and just with fury and just you know just tore, tore into him. And then he read it and he thought, "This I can't do. I can't do it." So he rewrote the scene. And what he does is he uses those words to be love. I love you, Dad. I love you, Dad. And, and you great saying you can't take that. That's even worse than being beat up. But here's what fiction does. That, that scene is so out of sequence. Because really, that happened when I was in high school. Actually, in the eighth grade. When I was in the eighth grade. And remember, I'm really not in that book. Or the movie, because I, as Pat would say, uh, when I'd ask him about it, he would say, "What did you want me to do? Right? Baby Goo Goo said this. Baby Goo Goo said that. So I'm Baby Goo Goo at that point, and so I'm, I'm cut out. And so um, what happened was the real scene, to me, is even worse than the scene he wrote about. Um, and we go to a movie on base. Um, Dad is pretty recently back from Vietnam. And so we all, as a family, Mom, well, we go in and we watch Butch Cassidy. You remember Butch Cassidy, the Sundance Kid, when it, when it first came out? So we're seeing that movie on base. Well, Dad goes to the Oak Club, and he drinks with his buddies he hasn't seen. And he comes back, and he's drunk. And so Mom calls him. 
you can't be driving when you're up. You know, we, and so they have this argument in the parking lot of the movie theater. And he hits her. And back pants. And, she, and so she grabs her keys and runs to the car. And as the kids, we're all just scared to death. So we're all running to the car. We get in the car. And mom starts the car. And you can hear an extra set of keys rattling outside. So he has an extra set of keys. And he gets in the car. And he knocks her across the, from the driver's seat, knocks her to the passenger seat. And we drive to, and we go to Pat's house. And that's where the scene unfolds at Pat's house. That's how Pat gets involved. But Pat's much older. He's a, you know, at that time, he's, he's, he's a teacher at the Fuston. At that time, and that scene actually takes place. So that's what fiction. I mean, when I look at it, that's what fiction is. It, it's sort of assembling these things that are half true, completely out of time. You know, could be completely stories that you might have told, and he assembles them into a story that's compelling, that's also authentic, but it's just not authentic in the way you think it's authentic. So anyway, I probably rattle. I probably went on too long. Going. That was wonderful, uh, tough, you know, tough truth to end on there. But that's that's some of the some of the Conroy uh, lifestyle growing up. Well, I, t I tell you, you know, instead of ending on that sad note, I mean, really, it's 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 you know how life is. It's remarkable, and you know, people um, have. Um, I've met along my journey is definitely, you know, in the, one of the themes of my book is, is how much in my life the stranger has saved me. People I haven't known that well um, have rescued me and come to my rescue over and over again. And so, you know, I, I just think we all in this moment, and I know this is trite, of, of constant political sighting. We got to remember what we have in common. And we, as we go through this, the complexity of our lives, we got to come together. And, and part of what literature can do, part of what poetry can do, is do that. Go, go, go walk on the beach, clear your heads. <laughs>